Uh, so what we talked about what we talked about last time was was uh, a truncated SVD, right? An approximating uh, point, approximating a matrix by a low rank matrix. Okay, and this is gonna this is gonna show up again today. And so uh, today I want to talk about principal component analysis, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, graph theory, and in particular spectral graph theory. All right, and you'll see that all these things are all connected. You know, truncated SVD and principal component analysis, and even this this uh, the idea of spectral clustering. That this is really just the same idea in a way. Okay. So we're going to going to talk about today's dimension reduction. Okay. So, so dimension reduction is is the is uh, you know a, this is also referred to as principal component analysis in the way that we're going to talk about it principal component analysis right very popularly known as PCA okay but what's the idea here the idea is that we're going to have endpoints. in rd rp okay i'm going to use the the notation from, from statistics yeah so here you'll probably notice that quite even in the script that uh you know people in statistics use p for dimension in some parts of math they use n for dimension in some parts they use d and the number of points also change so i try to it's it's easier for then when you go see later to be consistent with the part of math that we're closest to and not necessarily to be consistent throughout so just keep this in mind so i'm using p now because if you're going to go read about pc in any book we'll probably in statistics and they'll use p okay and so y y y1 through ym right so these are all points in rp okay and uh and now the point is that P, you should think of P as very, very large. So P is very large. And we want to represent these points in a, in a much, much lower dimensional, uh, uh, you know, in, in much lower dimensions. So we want the best d-dimensional. Uh, approximation or representation okay okay so so this is the this is the idea right so you should think of you know if I have say so I cannot draw very big dimensions right you would have maybe P is like in the thousands or even millions and uh, and uh, d would be in like the the tens you know something like this maybe hundreds uh, unfortunately i can only put you know to draw a picture i can only have uh, p being two and d being one but but hopefully you'll still be able to you know imagine what it would be in bigger dimensions but you can imagine having points right like many points like this right these are my y's Right, all my y's, and what I want is to approximate them by just a one-dimensional object, right? And so I can imagine approximating them by a one-dimensional object like this, in a way that they're, they're as close as possible, right? And then I can do a few things, right? I can write them. Once I have an, an equation for this line, I can just you know write them representing just by where in the line they are. So effectively, they're now each one described by just one parameter. Right, and I can call this parameter my new my new coordinates. Right, there's a few ways of thinking about this. Right, but what I would like is to have you know all these distances be as small as possible. Right, all these distances be very very small, and then instead of having the y's, I have these new points. Right, and now now it allows me to look at my data set and visualize it just in one D. Right, because now from here. I can just imagine now I just look at my data set like this. Right? And hopefully I'll see something. Of course, from two dimensions to one dimension, you're not really gaining much visualization. But you know, if this is in if this is very, very large, right, and P is much, much bigger than D, and in particular think of like D2 or 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 D equals three, you start being able to visualize, right? Allows allows for visualization and I'll show some examples. Okay. 
So, so maybe, uh, and so we're going to describe a principal component analysis. Maybe before I describe principal component analysis, let me show you an example. Okay, this is this is an example that I that I like. Uh, you know, it's quite a popular example. It's, it's a very nice one. So let me show you this. So I need to stop sharing this. I need to share something else. Okay, so here, and we'll see how to do principal common analysis. So this is a very famous, this is a very famous, you know, data analysis uh, uh, paper in which what was done was, was taken genomes of lots of people all throughout Europe there's a lot, a lot of pre-processing and data selection and all this, you know, let, let's put that in the, the, in the rug for now. And so what was done is they said, okay, let's grab all these genomes, right? They're vectors in humongous dimensions, right? I mean, I don't know how many, but you know, many, many. And where you can think of, say, the vector maybe saying putting one if there's a certain allele or zero if not, you know, so something of this style. And then this technique that we're going to describe, which is basically just truncated SVD, you'll see, you can now get uh, visualize the data set in two dimensions, right? You do principal common analysis to find sort of the best representation of the data set in two dimensions in a completely linear way. Okay? And so when you do this, right, when they do this, after all this pre-processing of the data, you see essentially the, the geography of Europe. I mean, it's kind of impressive, right? If you look at the, at the data set with, um, if you look at the data set with, uh, you know, th there's a few places here where, where, uh, where it's, uh, you know, where, 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 like there's the little letters of which country it corresponds to. And you see, right, there's the Burek Peninsula, France, Switzerland, Belgium, and so on. Then Italy going over here, right? Like it, it's, it's amazing, right? PCA did not know anything about geography. All it's doing is finding the two, the, the sort of the best in this way representation for this uh, for this data set of just genomes of people, right? And you completely capture the geometry of, of Europe. And in fact, I mean, given that we're in Switzerland, this even, this even sees uh, the, the different languages in Switzerland. So if you, if you look at, in particular, the, the samples that we're taking from, from people in Switzerland, you, you can even distinguish the, the language, right? And you see this here. It's, you know, I think the first time you see this, is, it's kind of incredible. Again, there's a lot of pre-processing. There's a lot of everything. You know, it's not just uh, you can just throw it in PCA like that, but almost. And um, okay, so let me stop sharing this. Share the rest. I'll, I'll put a reference to this. I mean, this paper is quite quite famous. It's called the uh, Genes Mirror Geography Within Europe, and this is if you Google it, this is extremely famous. Um, Okay, so 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 there, there, there's power to this technique, and we're going to see that this is basically just uh, this is just uh, truncated SVD. Okay, so I sometimes you know I teach principal component analysis in other ways, uh, very much through the more the more statistical viewpoint. Here I'm going to do it by basically showing that this is truncated SVD. Okay, okay. so so let's start. You know, in order to show that this truncated SVD, it makes sense to 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 center the points, right? Because I'm going to want uh, I'm going to it's much easier to describe lines that go through the origin. So the first step could just be center the points. Okay, so let's start. Right, let's start by centering the points. Okay, so let's take the point center. Okay, minus the, the average. Okay, just, just to, to, it makes the connection a bit easier to make. Okay, so I usually think of this, uh, you know, this vector is usually called mu, the mean of the points. Okay, just a uh, bit easier. Okay, but now the x's are centered. Okay, so now when I draw this picture, I'm actually going to have, uh, I'm actually going to have uh, the, the line go through the center. Okay, 
And of course, if I represent, you know, on the line going through the center, the, the representation is of course exactly the same, right? I just get, uh, I just have to add mu to go go back to the to the other point. Okay, so so what are we looking for, right? We are looking, right? We are basically we're looking for points z1, zn, or zm. Right, that lie in a d dimensional subspace and that are as close as possible to x1 through xn. Okay, so let's write this as an objective. So I think above, uh, yeah. So right when I was talking before, without a, without I didn't we, in this sense of approximation, I didn't need a, right to be a, an actual subspace with an affine space. Okay, but here we're trying we're now starting to make things a lot more precise. Okay, so let's write these these as a matrix, right? So let's write them as you know z one all the way through z m. Right, and x, x1, all the way through x1. Okay, so what do I mean by as close as possible? Of course, we, one can define uh, many different things, right? Perhaps the most, uh, the most natural of which would be to just have, uh, right, to just say that the sum of the squares of the distances need to be as small as possible, right? So. What we what what can we mean by that? We want them as close as possible. We want we can try to to we want small. And by this I mean we actually want minimum. But but let's not be quite as as precise for now. K one through m right of x k minus z k uh, squared. Right. So right. So we can try. Right, you can try to minimize over all possible z's exactly this objective. And how can I rewrite the fact that, um, how can I easily rewrite the fact that z1 through zm lie in the d-dimensional space? Right, so z1 through zm, right, lying in a d-dimensional subspace, right, is basically equivalent Right to the rank of this matrix Z being smaller or equal than D. Right, it's the same thing. Right. So really, what I'm trying to do, right, is I'm trying to find the minimum over the matrix Z. Right, such that the rank of Z is smaller or equal than D. And what I want to minimize, I want to minimize this sum, right? right? But so what is this? This is just, I take the, the matrix, the subtraction of the matrices, and all I'm doing when I'm taking the sum of the squares of these, of these L2 norm squares of the difference between the columns, right? This is exactly the same thing as just taking the Frobenius norm between the matrices, right? This is the same thing, right? This object here, it's the same thing as taking uh, x minus z for Binyo's norm squared. Right, so really this is just truncated SVD, right? We're just doing minimum, the rank of z smaller or equal than d, of the Frobenius norm of x minus z, or I mean, usually we write z minus x, of course, it's the same thing, right? So we know the answer, right? The solution is truncated SVD. So it means those pictures that I showed you of the, you know, of the projection of the genomes Taken uh, of uh, of different uh, you know different people in Europe was just done with the, with an SVD. Right, you take the SVD and then you look at these top 
right, at the top singular vectors. Okay, so now, in order to help a bit, get a bit more intuition on these things, it's helpful to actually work out what SVD would give, because there's two ways of thinking, you know, the, the, there's two ways of thinking about principal component analysis. Depending where you learn it, you might learn it differently. And basically, this difference amounts to when we take the SVD and we truncate it, do we, do we focus on the left singular vectors or do we focus on the right singular vectors? Okay. And it's sort of equivalent in a way. And this gives the two different ways of, of explaining PCA, depending where, where you, if you've learned it, depending where you've learned it, you might have learned one on the other. Okay. So it's a good way of showing you that, I mean, these two things are completely equivalent. Right. So what does it, what do we get? We get that the solution Z, right, is just, you know, there's a, this matrix U, right, which is the truncation of the, of the SVD for X. Right, so this I, I like always having the sizes of my matrices when I can. So this is P, this is T, this is sigma. Right, the truncation. So this is also size D, and maybe I guess uh, yeah, okay, and V transpose. This is of size M. Right, I try to write these things on the sides of my matrix, right? Is it P by D matrix, D by D matrix, and D by M matrix. Okay. Now, what does this mean? This means that we have, uh, right? We have for each, the columns of V, right? There's M of them. So each data point, we can associate now a column here, right? And these columns are now vectors in RD. Right? So they're now a, a d-dimensional representation of the vector. But let, let's see this a bit more precisely. Okay. So I can view this as, uh, or maybe I should I should write what I said, just to make sure it's here. Right. So each column of V transpose, right, or of sigma V transpose, right, it's just sigma will just do a scaling. Different coordinates scale differently, but it will just be a scaling. Uh, each column of the transpose is, in, is a representation or is a representation of of a vector or I, okay let me be more more this is kth column the kth column of vk can be viewed as viewed as a representation of xk right, as a vector okay, and these are basically the representations that you saw in this picture that I showed you that shows the geography of Europe okay so now let, let's be let's try to make this a little more a little more precise right so let me call this you know, let's call this matrix, we have this matrix. Let me include the, 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 the sigma, it's not so important. Kth column of this matrix, kth column, let's call it uh, BK. So let, let, so BK is the kth column of this matrix, okay? The point is that we have beta one, beta M, there's one corresponding to each of these uh, data points. And they are all d-dimensional. These are effectively the coordinates for PCA, right? You can view this as the coordinates for PCA. Okay, and depending what you're doing, you might want to scale them with sigma or not. But you know, scaling the coordinates, if you think of the picture of Europe, scaling the coordinates would be just making the north-south uh, stretcher or the, the, the east-west uh, stretch. Okay. So how, how do we make sense of this, right? The actual, the, the, the actual uh, way to precisely make sense of this statement, right, is that xk, right, my vector, my original vector xk, what is it, right? It's approximately, right, because the columns of Z approximate, approximate well the columns of, of X, okay, so it's approximately ZK. 
which is equal to, right, u times the column v, v to k. Okay, now the thing that I, that I didn't, uh, right, the thing that I don't have here is that the points weren't centered, so I should remove, I should go back and add the center, right, xk minus, when I center that, oh no, yes, xk's weren't centered. Wait, that's, sorry, I don't remember now if I center the x-case or the y-case. No, the x-case were centered, so it's all good. Okay. X-case were the z-case, which is basically ubk, or another way of saying this is that yk is basically, the original data points are this. Okay. Now, there's two ways of thinking of principal component analysis. Okay. One is, is this one, right? Beta 1 beta k are the new coordinates, are the d-dimensional coordinates of xk or yk. I mean, it doesn't really matter, right? The other way to think about it is that the, the, the left singular vectors, the u, right, these top left singular vectors, right, they are the, they are, are the bases on which to project the uk, right, are the bases of the d-dimensional the dimensional subspace that best approximates the the x1 to xn okay so and these are pca is often done in one way or the other okay i mean i'm not writing any theorems because right this is just inter not really doing any theorems. I'm just interpreting the formulas in different ways to, to, to see different things. Okay, so now PCA is usually not described like this. The way PCA is described, if you've seen it before, and if you have it, it's good that you see it once, so let me do it, but nothing, absolutely nothing changes, right? That if I have, uh, you know, you, you're, if you've seen PCA, it's about usually writing a uh, uh, a covariance matrix, right? So what is this? Is I take the, the sample covariance matrix for my points for my points yk. So how do we do this? We take one minus n. This, this normalization might seem strange, but if you've taken some statistics, you'll see you'll see why it's there. If not, it's not really important for here. Okay. So this object is the sample covariance. of y1 of the original data points, like them, okay. Now, in our language, what is this, right? This, in our language, I should say from k, from 1 to m. Uh, this is not, sorry, this is m, of course, not n. Otherwise, it would be even more strange because n is not a parameter, okay? So now in our language, what is this, right? Y case minus mu minus uh, mu are just the x's, right? So this is exactly x x transpose normalized the same way, right? And usually the way that we see PCA is is the following. So usually we see PCA in this way, right? PCA corresponds to take you know take the leading. Take the leading eigenvectors of the sample covariance matrix right and use this as the basis right and use this as the basis on which to right on which to project the data uh, phases of the of the subspace that approximates the data. Okay. Now, what is that? Well, this that's also very easy because, right? If I now write one over m minus one x x transpose, right? If I write now the SVD. Right, so let me write S X equals okay, so let me because now I'm I'm thinking about the full SVD, so let me write U F 
right? Just so that we don't have the same exact, right? So that there's no notation clash. Okay. All right, so what is this? This is one over M minus one, U F, F, V transpose F times the transpose of U F, the same thing. Sorry for all the Fs, but just, yeah, you should make them different and I won't keep them around for very long. Okay, so this is one over M minus one, right? So I get U F, then I get the sigma f. Okay, now the v transpose transpose moves to this side is a vf v v transpose v is identity. I get another sigma transpose. Basically, I get sigma square. Okay, so if you view this sigma as a rectangular matrix, what I mean by sigma square is the you know the obvious sigma versus sigma transpose. Maybe I should just write that just to be more. But it's just a diagonal matrix with the singular value square. Let me write this. Okay times u f transpose, right? This, this, when we think in terms of spectral decomposition, this is often called instead the matrix lambda, right? And so taking the leading eigenvectors of this matrix, right? Leading eigenvectors of this matrix are exactly the top left uh, singular vectors of x, right? So, so top, top e vectors of uh, say x, x transpose, right? They are, are the, the top, right, the left, the singular vectors, of x. Okay. I should say too that by doing it through the, even though oftentimes PCA is described through the sample covariance matrix, it's actually much faster to do it from the SVD. Right, because imagine that, that that M in this case M and D are a very different size. Right? You you could have cases in which this matrix is much, much bigger. Right? So if D is much bigger than M, for example, this matrix would be much bigger. But in any case, you have to compute XX transpose. Right? And oftentimes this, this takes actually quite a bit of time. Okay. There is another way of thinking about these, uh, right, about principal component analysis that I think is useful, which is to to view it the other way, right? Which is to view the covariance between the entries of X. Okay, so okay, we'll, we'll, I promise in the second half there will be theorems. But it's just that, you know, this one, it's useful to interpret these, um, these decompositions in different ways. And, uh, and uh, yeah, okay, so another way to write this is, is to do the following, is to take, instead of XX transpose, you take X transpose X. Okay, so you're doing, I mean, when you write the matrix, you could have write the, the data points as being rows, but maybe the best way of thinking about this is now you're taking the covariance matrix of the entries. Okay, but now this object, okay, let, let me not worry about normalizing, because I mean, of course, to take eigenvectors, the normalization doesn't matter. This object is an M by M matrix. Each entry corresponds, right? Each row and column correspond to a data point. Okay. And so now I can take this, right? What is this matrix? Okay, let, let's, let's look at what this object is. Right. XX transpose entry IJ right, is nothing more than just the inner product right, of XI and XJ. Right, I mean, oftentimes written as just this. Right, and now one, one, one way of, of thinking about what PCA is doing, right, this is another way of writing it, would be take, you know, PCA, and I've seen people view PCA in a different ways depending on what field they're in. Take leading eigenvectors of you know x transpose x and use use them as coordinates. Right? So literally make a point, right? What I mean by using them as coordinates is represent the point xk, right? There's some point xk represented by taking the, okay, let me think about, uh, you know, let me take it as a row vector because it'll be easier, I think, to see as, you know, the leading eigenvector of this at the entry k, the second one, the third one, and so on. And you may be interested in, you know, balancing them by the eigenvalues or not, right? Where, 
v1 is the is the leading eigenvector. Um, okay, let me let me be maybe a bit precise. Vk is the eigenvector corresponding to lambda k, and here I, I order them lambda one being the smaller, no the bigger. Okay, sorry, lambda one being the bigger. It's normal to do in. Uh, Okay, so yeah, this is also another unfortunate thing, but pay attention to this fact. When we have uh, when we have covariance matrices, it's more it's more class. Well, it depends where we are, but uh, later. Okay, so this is the same thing as the singular values, but later when I talk about uh, graphs, it will make a lot more sense to order the eigenvalues another way. So you know, always check how they are ordered. Basically, we order them in a way that the most the one that interests us most uh, becomes the one. Okay. And so now I claim this is exactly the other view of the truncated S of the truncated SVD, right? I mean, I think probably everyone sees it by now, right? But what is this? This is just, you know, in the other languages before. Sorry, and for all the Fs. Uh, make sure I don't forget anything. All right, so what is this? Again, now it's the U's that go away, and the V keeps here. So I, oh, I get VF, sigma F transpose sigma F, right? Which will be like my, you know, my uh, matrix of eigenvalues, right? They're just the square of the singular values in this case. Then, or the square of the singular values of X, right? This, right? So, so these are, corresponds exactly to the other view, right? So, so these are the, the right uh, singular of the right singular vectors of um, of x. Okay. So, I mean, there was no, you know, like forty minutes of no theorems, but it's very useful to to think about, uh, you know, to to just view that that this is the same exact same thing as pca now you know exactly what pca does you know where it comes from if you've seen pca you realize now that this is the same if you haven't seen pca you realize that all you have to do in pca is you compute the covariance matrix and take the leading eigenvectors or you just look at your data do truncate svd and then depending if you look at u or v right or if you put your vectors as rows or as columns you one of them are the bases in which they're being represented and the other they are the coordinates that you're representing them with, right? So to visualize, you should draw the coordinates, right? So, so right. So the formula to keep in mind really is this, right? I mean, these beta k's are just sigma v k, right? You can make this. I, I didn't worry too much of it, right? But these guys are just sigma v k, And sigma is just a diagonal thing with with the negative numbers, right? So it, it doesn't, yeah, it's only scales things. Okay. So now I want to say a few more things. Maybe, okay, let's see. I want to talk a little bit about kernels. Maybe before I talk about kernels, just say maybe this picture that I showed you of uh, you know of the of the genes uh, the, the the PCA of genes in Europe already convinced you that even very few dimensions already capture a lot about the data. Right? Now let me try to convince you in another way that that a lot that a few just a few dimensions already capture a lot about the data. Right. So again, let me switch what I'm sharing. Okay, so here is what we saw before, right? That it's capturing something. We don't know if it captures everything about the data or a lot about the data because we're not measuring any of this here. But if you go on the on the on the repository with the Jupyter notebooks that um, that that we have in the there's a link in the forum. I don't know how many of you have gone and, and tried it. So there is a new one, uh, a new a new notebook there. 
on applying SVD to MNIST. I mean, already with the with the, the squirrel picture, maybe I sort of convinced you that already low, you know, truncation to to very few singular values already already captures quite a bit, at least to the human eye, it seemed. So here the the game is a little different. Okay? So we grab the MNIST dataset, and you should definitely just you know play around with this and try different things to help your intuition. Okay, so. The idea is you grab the MNIST data set. So the MNIST data set are handwritten digits. I think probably most of you have seen it, right? Just in, in grayscale. And uh, what you do is you, you know, there, there are 28 by 28, uh, there are 28 by 28 pixel picture, you know, very, very simple picture. And there's a that nice data set to try to understand. You know, it's like the basic, most basic data set in machine learning, maybe. Okay. And so we're going to try and, and look at the SVD of it or do PCA for it, say. Right, so the idea here is you you treat them as a vector, right? So they're twenty eight by twenty eight by twenty eight pixels, but you push them in, a, you know, you put them in um, in just one vector, it becomes a vector of size uh, like a, around a thousand, yeah. So seven hundred eighty four, okay? and now you can st and now this is your dimension uh, dimension p, and you stack all of them. So there are uh, uh, whatever many six uh, sixty thousand of these data points. Okay, so now I have a matrix. Okay, so here in the Jupyter Notebook, this is the other way around. So it's a matrix that's 60,000 uh, times 784. In the, in, the, in the thing that we had in the notes was, was the transpose of this, but of course, not, nothing, you know, the singular value composition is the same, just replace the U and the V. Okay, and, and now, you know, Christoph coded here, you can look at if the singular vectors, because they themselves, the ones that are indexed uh, by, by the dimension, Right, the U's in our language, they do. Sh they should look like images. So you can actually try to understand what they're trying to capture. You can like tell tell story. You know, people tell stories about what they say and so on. But what I mean, and you can, you should definitely, you know, go here and play around with it. Try to find things. Try 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 it out. But what I show here is just the plot of the singular values. Okay, so I take. We take all these MNIST, uh, you take the MNIST data set. So now you build this matrix with 60,000 60, data points, dimension around uh, 780, uh, dimension 784. And now we want to see how much energy is it in the in the lower, you know, in the bigger principal component, in the principal, principal components or in the strongest, in the leading uh, singular vectors, right? So we look at the values of the singular values, right? Then we just plot them from the biggest one to the smallest. And you see that they decrease you know, extremely quickly, right? At like 30, like at 30 singular values, you already have almost all the energy, right? The rest is much, much smaller. Right? And in fact, if you try to do PCA, you should definitely grab this and try. You'll see, you'll see them, you know, the ones going somewhere, the twos going somewhere else. You'll start seeing things of this type. Okay, and then in things that, that Nikita is going to talk about in the second part of the course, when we're going to start doing supervised learning, right? Which would be, I actually tell you that a few of these pictures are ones, a few are twos, and so on. Can you guess what the other ones are? Sometimes you can you can use this such, these kinds of things to push your dimension down, so that then that that problem becomes easier. Right? And people do this all the time. Okay, so here we're still in the setting of unsupervised learning of treating the data without labels. We don't know the ones from the twos or anything, and then right, this can be plugged in or not in uh, in uh, supervised learning things later okay but you know play around with the code and, and make some of these experiments just there's there's it's a very good way of starting to get uh, you know linear algebra uh, intuition over linear algebra there's the how to prove things but there's also like what's the meaning of these eigenvectors and singular vectors and so on okay so we'll take a break now i'll fix the poll that didn't work and then we will uh, we'll come back and I'll talk about uh, a little bit about kernels, not not a lot, and then I'll talk, I'll introduce spectral graph theory, and and so we'll, we'll go back to to some some theorems, maybe not in the kernels but in spectral graph theory. Okay, and I'll be around a bit if there's any questions, and um, and yeah, then I, I have to get out this for a second to fix the poll because I can't do it while the meeting is on, but I'll be here for a bit and then I'll have to shut down the meeting and I'll open it again. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, there's a very that's a very good question. So I usually I, I explain this. I, I completely forgot this time. So the point is that uh, yeah, this is a very good question. So in linear, the difference is that. 
well, okay, for, for one dimensional, they look very similar, but they still are, are somewhat different. And the difference is that in linear regression, you would evaluate the points by how far they are in vertical distance, right? Axes have meaning, right? Like you would evaluate how good your, your approximation is by how far away it is in the y-axis. While in PCA, because the axes have no meaning, we're evaluating by the distance to the line. And so these can be very different, right? If I have a, you, actually, it's, uh, there, there's very nice examples. We will put one at the, in the homework at some point that, you know, you can imagine that as the line gets tiltier and more and more tilted, that you can come up with, very, with examples on which optimizing in the sense of linear regression is very, very different than optimizing in the sense of PCA. But the main thing is that PCA doesn't see doesn't see the the um, this, it's it's rotation invariant. By this, what I mean by PCA is rotation invariant is a fancy term to say that it doesn't care about where the axes are. Like I drew the axes, but I could have not. It would be the same. Like if the axes were like this, you know, this would be the same the same answer. And this is not true for linear regression. So this is the this is the key difference. And linear regression, right, is something in the world of supervised learning or you know, statistical statistical estimation. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it's it's unfortunate I can only draw in uh, you know in so few dimensions, so they look a lot a lot more similar than they really are. But uh, if you start looking at corner cases, like you start putting the the points like very very close to the axis, you'll see like you can't even make sense of linear regression then. So is there any more question? Any other question? No, it's in the same. It's really in the same basis, but you wouldn't have to compute both. It, it really is the same PCA, right? So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is a good. I see a question in the chat, uh, but I'm not sure I understand it because probably I didn't take it. Uh, like I didn't see the question at the right time, and so now I don't know what it's talking about. So if the person could ask it again, I'll... but okay, one one question at a time. So take. Even I am not seeing the Jupyter Notebook. OK, so let me uh, stop sharing. And I'm not even sure that. OK, uh, yeah. Oh, you were, all this time you were seeing the Jupyter Notebook. So all the pictures I drew about the, the orthogonal bases uh, for the question of linear regression were, oh, that is too bad. OK. Yeah, so apologies to the person who asked me about the linear regression. I was drawing. Uh, Pictures, yeah, I was, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I, I was doing this, uh, you know, with this in front, and I erased uh, these and did all sorts of, ex of uh, examples as I was talking, and I realized now that all of this was uh, not showing. But was it still clear? It was a very good question, and I wanted to make sure that it's, did it still make sense, the, 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 the comp comparison with linear regression? Yeah, okay, maybe at the beginning I'll do it again. Okay, so now your question. You can view you can view PCA in two ways. Okay? One is you you say let's write my vector yk, okay, all the data points yk as in a in a d-dimensional basis, right? Again, like you should have uh, uh, some nice things p by d, right? So you're writing them in a d-dimensional uh, space plus some some you know some shift. Let's not worry about the shift. And now you can ask, what is the basic? What is the the the, the subspace 
that makes where I can write it that makes it the best approximation to y. Okay? And so you can now say, okay, let's optimize over mu, bk, beta k's, and u, a basis, the sum of the differences between all the i k's and these and these approximations, right? These z k's. And you write up a big optimization problem, takes like 30 minutes of working it out, and it will answer that the solution is u needs to be the leading eigenvectors of x. But actually, we already have that solution. Like the, the proof of the, that the truncated SVD is the best approximation for Venus norm answers that for us. And right, so this is one way to think about PCA. Another way to think about PCA, which maybe is harder to justify, but because we have access to truncated SVD theorems, for us is easy to justify, is that you can view it in a different way, which is instead of taking a, a P by P matrix, you take an M by M matrix. Okay. And now in this M by M matrix, right, the covariance matrix between the data points, not, not between its coordinates, right? So in, main, in entry ij, you put the inner product between data point i and data point j. Think of this as like a matrix of similarities, right? The inner product will be very high if things are very similar, and they'll be very small if things are, or even negative if things are very dissimilar. Okay. And now you can say, let's take the leading eigenvectors of this object. Okay. And now if you take the leading eigenvectors of this object, right? I'm putting the eigenvectors here as, as v1, uh, v, you know, to say v, v2, v3, say. These eigenvectors are, vec they have m coordinates. Okay. And, and so now one way to, to, and now what you can do is you can grab x and for every data point, you know, think, for every genome, think in the example in your, or every point in data in MNIST, you can associate three coordinates so that you can picture it in three dimensions, right? You use some like three-dimensional plot software and can do this. And the point, the way that you're going to represent it is given for point K is going to be represented in coordinates as the numbers V1K, V2K, and V3K. This feels weird, right? This feels a bit weird to do, maybe. Right, but, but it's, it's self-consistent, right? You do have one entry in the eigenvector per data point. So at least it's self-consistent. Might look a bit weird, but it shouldn't now that we have the truncated SPD because all, this, all these Vs are, they are exactly the leading right singular vectors of the matrix X, right? And so we saw that the solution to this it's not only that u, that the basis, right? When, when we looked at the solution up here, right? It's not only that the, the basis in which you write are the top left singular vectors, but actually the coordinates in which you write are the top right singular vectors. So each set of singular vectors has a meaning. And, and if you do it through the string case SVD, this becomes clear. If you think of the SVD in another way, it's maybe not quite as clear that these are the same thing. I mean, it's also not very complicated because once you have u being being something and you try to optimize for the beta for the beta case, this is just a least squared linear system. So if you work it out, you you get that uh, you know that there'll be a least squares and the solution will be exactly this 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 matrix V. But uh, but you still have to do a bit more. And so is it clear what I mean by the coordinates? And this is what you see when you see these pictures, like the one for you know. For the, the the Europe geography, that's exactly what you're seeing. Of the eigenvectors. Yeah. You can yeah. yeah, try to work it out. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. So Okay, there's there's an option that you may or may not do. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter, which is if you decide to include a sigma, the matrix sigma in it, right? The point is that, uh, right? The matrix sigma, all it's going to do is gonna is gonna expand and shrink some uh, some of the dimensions, some of the coordinates. So it will just like extend the map of Europe this way or this. So it doesn't really change very much to how you look at it. And so you can take it or not. Sometimes you take like the square root. I mean, people do all sorts of things, but that's not quite as important. And so that's why I'm being a bit ambiguous between the beta case and the VKs, but yeah, they, they're the same up to this scaling.
Okay, so I will I'll, I'll shut this down. Do the to to make the poll, fix the poll, and then I'll open the meeting again. So sorry, everyone, to, to force you to come back. Let's come back in like two or three minutes. <laughs>